Dzień dobry. Nazywam się Aleksander Newman. Przepraszam, nie mówiał po polsku. Dziękuję za uwagę. My name is Alexandra Newman, as I said, and um, first of all, a little bit about myself. Um, I have a Master in Science from the University of Edinburgh in Book History and a second Master of Science from the University of Glasgow in Information Management. Um, I will also be starting a PhD in September on the work of the binder Douglas Cockrell and Son and how they pioneered the field of book conservation. Uh, I'm also the assistant librarian at the Royal Scottish Academy in Edinburgh, and I'm an avid social media user. And here you can see some of my accounts, and um, here is the conference hashtag if you want to live tweet during the conference. So, um, today I would like to talk to you about how libraries have a great deal to gain by establishing a social media presence. A combined 10,500 people follow me across Instagram, Tumblr, and Twitter. And that's a lot of eyes on one individual's social media presence, especially when said individual is not a celebrity. I started from scratch. I'm not an established institution or brand, and my identity is not <coughs> part of the public consciousness. However, libraries are already part of communities, both at home and internationally. And so they already have a known brand and vision and this can help them build and maintain a strong social media presence. So just a bit about my social media story and how you can use it to help you build social media for libraries. Um, I started my social media basically to share the cool stuff I look at. It's a simple reason, but it's true. <laughs> um, I'm from a small city in Kansas in the United States, Wichita. And um, we don't have any medieval manuscripts or even books from before the year 1800. Many of the things I get to interact with as a book historian and librarian are things that my friends and family have never seen outside of museums or on TV. I also started my social media as a promotional tool to show my outreach and writing skills. It's sort of a way of publishing without really being published. Um, I can write short informational articles that demonstrate my knowledge and passion for sharing books with people and book history. So how it really started going for me, how it snowballed, was um, the platforms of Instagram and Tumblr. Um, <coughs> unlike Facebook and Twitter, their front pages are at the moment unhampered by algorithms that try to predict and guide the interests of their users. Meaning that content posted to Instagram and Tumblr has a more equal shot at being seen. Um, I already had a personal Instagram and Tumblr account, uh, mostly populated with pictures of my cats and selfies, as you can see, because, you know. <laughs> but um, when I began my first master's degree at the University of Edinburgh and got a job in an antiquarian bookshop, book pictures and posts began to replace cat pictures and amusing personal anecdotes. When it came to Instagram, I simply allowed it to sort of be taken over by my book posts without making any commitment to a theme at first. Uh, this allowed me to still post the occasional selfie or cat. <laughs> However, I created a second Tumblr account in 2014 in order to better organize <coughs> and show off the increasing number of book posts I was making on my personal Tumblr as well as to differentiate between my personal and professional social media presences. Using the tags, which I will further define later, such as library, rare book, and special collections, um, my posts became sort of filed with um, other libraries and institutions posts. Also, by uh, using the no filter tag, uh, my posts were further exposed to a new audience. And for those of you unfamiliar, um, on Instagram you have these options, which are known as filters, that um, they sort of change the appearance of a photograph, and you can add them to your photo to make it look more artsy. But um, people do tend to take pride in not using filters, so tagging a post as no filter sort of gives you a new audience. To my surprise, institutions such as the American Antiquarian Society, the Morgan Library, and the Bodleian Library at Oxford started to follow me, comment on my posts, 
and um, the personal accounts of librarians in those institutions also began to follow me. Um, this is Christine Nelson, who is the manuscript librarian at the Morgan <coughs> Library. Engaging in dialogues with such prestigious institutions and people as a budding book historian really encouraged me to step up my game and gave me a lot of confidence. I became more self-aware of the pitch of my posts and made a conscious effort to stick to a friendly but informal tone. I also began to more carefully curate what I was posting and when, so I could be sure that interested parties knew what I was up to. I took cues from the way institutions structured their posts, making sure to properly give the title, shelf number, and time period of the material at the end of the post. I also began to participate in theme tags, such as Manuscript Monday, Wet Nose Wednesday, and Here Comes the Sunday. And here are some examples of these um, theme tags. Uh, on the <coughs> Manuscript Monday, you're supposed to post a manuscript, whether that be from the Middle Ages, or a handwritten letter, or something. But um, if you tag in Manuscript Monday, you'll be part of that theme. Wet Nose Wednesday, um, you post pictures of dogs. <laughs> Um, whether they be from print or manuscript, in this case, manuscript dog from uh, University of Glasgow manuscript. And here comes the Sunday was a popular tag last spring when we were all waiting for spring to get here and being very impatient because it was a very dark winter. <laughs> but um, you would post pictures of the sun. I even created a few tags of my own. Forage Friday is my most successful and now has 350 contributions from other people. And this is an example of when you click on the tag in Instagram, these posts come up. And um, they're mostly by other people, but that one's mine. <laughs> and I originated that tag, and lots of people now participate, which is very exciting. My follower count built slowly until I had about 1,000 followers when two amazing things happened. Christine Nelson tagged me in a post of her favorite book Instagrams to follow. And Instagram itself included me in a list of the best library and librarian accounts. This caused me to gain about 3,000 followers over the span of two weeks. And around this time, I also started updating my book Tumblr more regularly and linking it occasionally on Instagram. By tagging my posts in a similar way to how I did on Instagram, my posts would pop up if users searched for keywords like library or illuminated manuscript. And here's an example of a Tumblr post that I made for World Book Day. Um, it's part of my workspace at the, um, the Royal Scottish Academy. And down here are the tags. So I tagged at Royal Scottish Academy, World Book Day, and Library. So that way people searching for any of those things, if they click on that, they'll find my post. Um, several of my posts were reblogged by the University of Missouri Library and the University of Iowa Library, both of which have follower counts in the tens of thousands. So that was a great exposure for my blog. But recently, an Easter-themed post was reblogged by the Getty, which has several hundred thousand followers. So that was very exciting. <coughs> um, so in order for you to better use my experience, uh, I've identified a few things that might be useful. Uh, after trial and error, I've found that illuminated manuscripts and old attractive book bindings tend to yield the most interaction from followers and viewers. Using this knowledge, I try to generate about five posts a week on Instagram and one long-form original post a week on Tobler, based on uh, the materiality of manuscripts and books. And, um, for those of you not familiar with the term materiality in terms of books, is understanding books as cultural objects separate from but often relating to the value of their text. And I also talk about art history and the history of illuminations. So a few examples of things that I post. Um, marginalia, like this guy, and uh, also a note down there. Damage, which is I find really interesting. Um, this is holes in a parchment, and you can see the federal bead behind it. Um, I also post about the transition from manuscript to print, which is one of my favorite topics. And grotesques, those are always popular. Um, I recently got to see the Hieronymus <coughs> and so I can see him because he looks very Hieronymus Bosch-esque. And also general highlights posts. This is the National Archives in Edinburgh. And it's just 
stacks of books, and it's amazing. And I wanted to share it with everybody, and as you can see, it's very popular. <laughs> But social media is also a fun, funny place, and this is an example of uh, a valentine that I made as a joke. And um, I'm not sure if anybody used it, but um, you've stolen my heart, no fooling, based on the, the fool in the image. So, um, social media is very visual, as you can see, and eye-catching or aesthetically pleasing things <coughs> tend to be better than overly wordy but informative posts. The key is to catch people's eye and give them a small to medium chunk of information in order not to wear out their attention span. After building them up, I began to make references to my social media accounts on my CV or my resume. Um, and I use them as a sort of active portfolio of experience as well as proof of my success in my social media story and how I educate people about books. So themes you can use from my social media story are tags, which I mentioned before. They're sort of a filing system for posts on social media such as Instagram, Tumblr, and Twitter. Um, they're keywords that you can click on and it can take viewers to a display of all posts <coughs> in that tag. So here's an example on Tumblr of the tag Illuminated Manuscript. And you can see posts tagged with Illuminated Manuscript down here and users who often use the tag Illuminated Manuscripts, including me. This tagging system is fairly democratic. Um, my library post could be found displayed next to the British Library's posts, along with many other users, uh, individuals and institutions like the Penn Library's manuscripts. Interaction is another key term. It's important to remember that social media is not a one-way street. <laughs> By linking, following, and commenting, people can become familiar with you and you become familiar with them, forging an often mutually beneficial connection. Um, on Tumblr, this is particularly important. Uh, the reblog function allows you to add someone else's blog post to your own blog, as well as to add comments. Reblogging is an important part of the ecology of Tumblr, as there's no way to comment on posts, which is just sort of a, a Tumblr thing. And remember, it's called a social network for a reason. It bears many similarities to professional networking in the academic world and leveraging connect connections to get yourself noticed. Here's an example of um, interaction. Um, this is a small collection of small books, um, which is also a theme day, Tiny Tuesday. And it shows um, feedback from non-librarians, sort of people that follow me because they're interested, as well as the American Antiquarian Society. And it just shows the, the different kind of people that you can get commenting and enjoying your posts. Proper attribution is an, um, another <coughs> thing. Um, it's all well and good to post pretty pictures, but for research and reference purposes, followers should really get a shelf mark, date, and title. It's sort of like putting a label under a painting at a museum. Not everyone would be able to recognize a Michelangelo painting without being told it's by Michelangelo, just as many people can't tell the difference between a 14th century illuminated manuscript and a 16th century illuminated manuscript. Even if people never do request that particular book for their own research, uh, it can help get people familiar with shelving schemes and call numbers and just how the library is organized. And here's an example of attribution on one of my posts. Um, in this case, the University of Glasgow Library, which holds this manuscript, has an Instagram as well. So I can tag them, and they'll see that post and see that I use their manuscript. But it also has MSGen288, which is the work that that image is from, um, the time period, and it's from a book of hours, so it doesn't really have a title. It's um, more of a, a, a genre. So finally, um, power users. Users with a lot of followers and therefore a lot of influence. If they link or promote your social media account, it turns a lot of eyes in your direction and can translate into a lot of followers and a lot of exposure. But it can be difficult for users with a lot of followers to take notice of certain followers doing interesting things. So remember, interaction is key here. Comment, like, and try to let them get to know you. For me, gaining the attention of these users is a very organic process, but for libraries trying to quickly establish a presence, a more direct route might be better. 
Uh, individuals maintaining institutional accounts have been known to email Tumblr or Instagram directly and get results and be featured. So, how you can use my experience. In a way, my early experiences on social media are similar to how many libraries, li libraries and institutions first approach the medium. Just setting up an account and hoping for the best, basically. But libraries, as institutions with many different people and voices, can struggle with maintaining a stable social media presence without at least a basic plan. <coughs> different contributors with different tones can lead to a flood of vastly different posts happening all at once, followed by periods of no posts, just silence. As I'm the only one that maintains my accounts, I don't really have an issue with this period of silence or maintaining a certain tone, but libraries setting goals and sticking to a schedule can help to alleviate these problems as well as generate excitement. People begin to expect your posts and wonder what you'll be posting next. <laughs> Social media is an amazing marketing tool. Not only is it free, it places you in the line of sight of a more diverse audience than that of your campus regulars or your patrons. Here are some graphs of total social network users in 2015 in the United States. And even just in the United States, it's a huge number of people. 179 million, and it's only going up. Um, here are users for Instagram and Tumblr, and as you can see, the yellow and red sections belong to sort of a younger user base, and on Instagram and Tumblr, there's a lot of those. So, when you make a post on Instagram and Tumblr, you're basically speaking to the future and saying, come to our university, use our collections, and it's, it's a good publicity tool. <coughs> So, sort of a case study, um, social media, yeah, case study, sorry. <laughs> um, as an individual with access to several different uh, special collections, I can relatively easily tailor my posts to show what gets attention, but this might not be so easy for other libraries and museums, particularly institutions with smaller, obscure collections. Um, as a case study, this is the University of Reading Collections Tumblr. Um, they are home to the Museum of English Rural Life, mostly focused on farming equipment and practices, something that most people probably wouldn't find that interesting. Um, here are some examples of their posts, so wagon, farming, cows, not that great. However, um, Adam Kozari, who uh, runs the accounts, found the key to be enthusiasm, a good hook, and interaction to sort of getting people involved with a seemingly boring collection. Sharing all aspects of your collection in an enthusiastic way will generate user feedback and allow you to tailor, tailor your posts to the interests of your community. And it's really important to remember, especially when you're dealing with a museum that might be boring, to have fun. This is an amusing post. It's one of my favorite posts from the University of Reading. <laughs> um, they have a lot of paintings of show-winning and prize-winning livestock, and they all kind of look weird. <laughs> so they're, they're making a joke about how, how the sheep is shaped like a square and, and saying amusing things about it. However, they also link their collection of prize-winning animal paintings. So. It's funny and it's a promotion. So, um, as sort of a further case study, uh, the Royal Scottish Academy, I work there as the assistant librarian, but I've also <coughs> taken on the responsibility of creating a social media presence for them. So, just a little bit about the Royal Scottish Academy, uh, or the RSA. It was founded in 1826 in Edinburgh as a result of a disagreement with the Royal Academy in London. Um, it's housed in a neoclassical temple-type building uh, in the center of Edinburgh, built by William Henry Playfair, and this is his architectural drawing. And this is it today, or yesterday. <laughs> um, they host a continuous program of scholarships, <laughs> awards, and exhibitions to show off um, artists who live and work in Scotland. When I first came to the RSA, they had a Facebook, a Twitter, and a Pinterest, none of which were ever really updated with any regularity. 
As the RSA maintains a relatively small staff, the staff member that was assigned to maintain the social media was also in charge of art sales as well as some curatorial duties. So they didn't really have a lot of time to properly maintain the social media accounts. Each account also had a different user icon and a different description, which could possibly be confusing to viewers who are trying to establish what the identity of the RSA's brand is. I became aware of the lack of a good strategy as soon as I started posting items from their collections on my personal accounts, as there was no easy way to give the RSA proper attribution. <coughs> So I wrote out a social media strategy for the RSA. And step one was to lay down reasons for wanting to establish a social media presence. So give them a need and then fill that need. Um, this is the brief introductory paragraph that comes directly from my strategy. And it talks about how um, they can use social media to connect artists and patrons, as well as to bring people into the RSA. Step two was to set some achievable goals. It's important to make goals that you can actually stick to and achieve. And again, this is from my strategy. Um, obviously, big one is to increase the awareness of the RSA's collections, archives, and library. As the RSA maintains um, a lot of current art and encouragement of people making art right now, their collection doesn't get a lot of publicity. So social media can be used to publicize the collections. Um, also to increase traffic to the exhibitions. And to um, a specific one is to fulfill the objective of developing a web presence linked to the new RSA website. And it's important to pay attention to institutional things that are also going on and try to connect social media to that to make it more important. Step three is to provide suggestions for how to achieve these goals. And again, bullet points from my strategy. Um, decide, a specific one was to decide what degree the art and library archives will be separated. Um, if there would be separate accounts, just sort of organizational things. Um, two sort of hard hitting goals were create an account on Instagram and delete the Pinterest account, both of which occurred, which was great. My strategy was met with a great deal of enthusiasm from <coughs> the staff and the members of the academy, but nobody really had the time to take on the responsibility of maintaining a social media presence. But I expected this, and it didn't surprise me. I was actually kind of hoping. Uh, I volunteered to get the social media up and running. Sometimes an institution needs a trailblazer to lay the groundwork for continued efforts. As without some proven success, those at the top are less willing to support forays into untested waters. Three months after establishing the RSA's Instagram, it has over 370 followers. We just crossed 370 this morning, actually. And um, this was helped by cross-promoting it on my own blog, acting sort of as a self-contained power user.